Let's allow the man of God to come and uh, minister to us. Karibu. Welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Karibu, son. Well, somebody shout glory. glory. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to your very precious people. Thank you that revelation knowledge is gifted everybody. Bodies and yokes are destroyed, and whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. We give you praise, glory, and honor for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands, let's release our faith together. As we say these words, I am born of God. I am born of, I am born of, the, world. Am born of the world. The word of God, word of God is, my is my nature. I do not struggle, do not struggle. to do the word. I do the word naturally therefore today i will understand the word of his grace i will be built up by the end of this service i will never be the same never ever be the same again in jesus name can we celebrate jesus the risen lord glory amen grab your pen your notebook your bible you can be seated with your sweet smart self as we get in the world praise god once again i want to appreciate pastor karanja and his and his wife and um, this church family for granting us access to this whole conference and everybody who took out the time to be here we love you all we're glad to have all of you in the conference the online community we love all of you and we encourage you to help us share the videos get more people to hook up to the services so that we can do more together and get the word around let me also announce that we came with the books and the books are already here you can get as many as possible this evening and i will be i will stay behind for a few minutes to autograph those books for you like i said in the first service this morning the reason why we travel with books is because we have limited time to be with you and there are things we say that time does not allow us enough enough uh, opportunity to do proper exegesis over them and we don't want to leave you hanging with information so we come with books and that's why it's important for you to invest into the books and spend time reading them and understanding them. All the books I write are doctrinal materials. There's none of them that is just inspirational. They're all exegesis. They're all sound doctrine materials. So get as many as you can, if possible, get all of them and line them up and begin to chew on them one by one. They will help you so much with so much that is being taught. Let me also mention, that, like I said in the previous service, We'll have a Bible school here in Nairobi next year. So I want to encourage all of you that are interested to start making reservations with Pastor Jerome at the back. You know, if you get your information across to him, he will get all the forms and everything sent across to you early. So you're among the people who register early and help us get the news around Kenya so that more people can come, grab this truth and run with it because the whole essence is to get Jesus all over the world. Can I hear a good amen? Now, Let's get in the word. Uh, we, we began to deal with something this morning. Were you blessed? All right, let's get in it. Romans 16, 25. Romans chapter 16, verse number 25. While teaching is going on, if you have questions, you can write them so that when we are done, you can pass your questions across. Now to him, that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. And then we began to say, what is the gospel of brother Paul? Now put your fingers in Romans 16, 25. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Next verse. He says in verse 2, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. What's the gospel? Next verse. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So the gospel, the first line of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures not according to visions and dreams according to the scriptures next line of the gospel and that he was buried third line of the gospel and that he rose again the third day how according to the scriptures that is the gospel 
So brother Paul now says the gospel is the message of his death, burial, and resurrection. So go back to Romans 16, verse number 25. Romans 16, 25. Now to him, that is a power to establish you according to my gospel, which is Christ died according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he called that the preaching of Jesus Christ. So what is the preaching of Jesus Christ? Death, burial, and resurrection. The preaching of Jesus Christ is not that he died. The preaching is the resurrection. But there will be no resurrection without death. So it is the death that gave rise to the resurrection. But the message is the resurrection, not the death. The resurrection. Because it is in the resurrection that he brought many sons to glory. Are we teaching here? So the message is the message of his resurrection. Christ rose from the dead. And when he rose, we rose. When Jesus rose, we rose. Is that true? Ephesians chapter 2 from verse, from verse 8. Ephesians, in fact, start from verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, what happened? Had quickened us together with who? Christ. So when he rose, we rose. Now, put your finger in Ephesians 2. I know we started with Romans 16. Flip over quickly. Let's get to I mean, Ephesians chapter 2. Flip over. Christ rose. And when he rose, we all rose together with him. Now, hold on. He didn't rise alone. In his resurrection was our resurrection. Yes, Romans chapter 8 verse 10 and 11. <clears throat> we'll come back to Ephesians. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. The moment Christ entered, you died. So there's nothing like, shall we continue in sin? You are dead. Dead men don't continue. You are dead. You are dead. Glory. Are you dead? Or you are alive? Who is alive? Who is dead? Who is alive? Whose life is in you? So when you function, who is functioning? Who are you living for? So there's nothing like, shall we continue in sin? You are dead. Dead men don't continue. So if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of what? So life means righteousness. Are you alive in Christ? What does it mean? You are righteous in Christ. I'm teaching good. Now look at the next verse. Oh, glory to God. Can we all read together everybody? Verse 11. Romans 8, 11. One, two, go. No, 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 no. Romans 8, not 10. Romans 8, 11. All right, let's go. One to go. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell where? He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit. That what? Where is the spirit of God? It dwells in you. That is the seal for rapture. The reason why we know you will be raptured is that you have the Holy Ghost. It is the spirit that will quicken that dwells in you. The spirit will not fall on you. It's already in you. Why is the spirit of God in you? To guarantee your resurrection. Because the spirit that rose Christ from the dead was there to raise him up. That same spirit entered you to raise you up. From mortality to immortality. Why? Because you've been bought with a price. You are Jesus' property. Forever Satan cannot lay claim on you. Jesus paid Satan complete to own you forever. You owe the devil nothing. The spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells on your inside. 
And that same spirit shall rejuvenate. Shall revitalize. Shall bring to life your mortal bodies. Glory to God. Even when we were dead. Had quickened us. Quickened. Made us alive. So our life is his spirit. Our life is the spirit of God. He's called the spirit of adoption. He's called the spirit of his son. He's called the spirit that raised Christ from the dead. He dwells. He does not visit you. The spirit does not visit you. The Lord shall visit you. Fraud. Fraud. How can the person living in me be visiting me? Why are you playing with my head? Visitation 2022. Fraud. My God will visit you. Fraud. He lives in me. And he will never leave me. So I don't need a visitor. I need the dwelling Christ. And he lives on my inside. So as believers, we don't sing, breathe upon me, breath of God, fraud. How can the person living in you be breathing? Where is he breathing from? Come Holy Spirit, I need you. Get born again. Holy Spirit, move me now. Move you to where? Make me whole again. Whole. So the first one he did was fake. You need a real one. I'm teaching good. You know we sing a lot of stupid things we don't even think about. Anointing. From where? From the olive tree. Anointing. Lord, the power of the Holy Ghost. But the spirit you have received of him abided in you. First John chapter 2 verse 27. First John chapter 2 verse number 27. We'll come back to Romans. First John 2 27. But the anointing. Everybody let's read together. But the anointing which you have received. Wait, wait. The anointing which you will receive. The anointing which they will put on you with oil. The anointing which you have received present or past tense. So right now you are anointed. You don't need to fast for the anointing. The anointing is on your inside. Abide it. Abide it. It does not travel. Abide means you are the residence of the anointing. That means you are the bottle of oil. The oil is inside you. Abideth in. In you. And you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things. Now somebody say we don't need pastors. No that's not what he's saying. He's dealing with false prophets. The pretext and context of this verse John was writing is false prophets. You don't need any of these false prophets to teach you. The only people that are permitted to teach you are the same people that have the same spirit with you. Because the same spirit in me is the same spirit in you. And as I'm teaching, you're seeing it in the Bible, in your spirit there is a witness. So your mind may not capture it, but your spirit is capturing it and your spirit is responding. Eventually your mind will open up to it. But as the same anointing teacher of all things and his truth, and it's no lie. And even as it has taught you, you shall abide. Stay there. Don't let anybody fool you with olive oil as anointing. The anointing is not olive oil. The anointing is a person. And that person is living inside you. You are the tree of oil. If they need oil, they should come and get from you. You are the oil container. 
Glory to God. Some, some Christian habalists won't like what I'm teaching. Because they've made a lot of money from selling oil. <laughs> One of the major merchandise in African churches is oil. Fraud. The spirit came to live in you. Not to visit you. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Mm -mm. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Then we get to Ephesians chapter 2 where we came from. In whom also you trusted. Did you trust the Lord Jesus? In whom also you trusted. You trusted him after that you heard the word of truth. What is the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation. Not the gospel of prosperity. Not the gospel of deliverance. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after you had salvation and you believed. You were sealed. With that Holy Spirit of promise. Give me amplified brother. Hey. Labor dada. Every born again child has an eternal seal. That's why salvation is eternal. In him you also who have heard the word of truth, the glad tidings, gospel of your salvation and has believed and adhered to and relied on him, we are stamped with the seal of the long promised Holy Spirit. This is stamp. This is a seal of ownership. Nobody breaks that seal. Only the person who put it there. It's a seal. And you are sealed until the day of the redemption of the purchased possession. You didn't hear what I said. You are sealed until the day of the redemption of the purchased possession. You didn't hear that. You are sealed until the day of the redemption of the purchased possession. That means when Jesus bought you, he put a seal. The seal is not a stamp. The seal is a person. His spirit entered you to stay there. Until the day of redemption. How many of you remember in Africa back in the days. Thank you brother. I'm getting there. In Africa back in the days. We'll soon read that. That's verse 14. In Africa back in the days. When we used to drink Mirinda. You remember Mirinda? Do you still have it? Is there... If you get me a bottle, I will drink tonight. Not Pepsi, just the Mirinda. I used to like Mirinda cold. We used to have Mirinda, 7 Up, Team. You remember Team? T E E M. You didn't have Team, but we had Team in Nigeria. It was part of that brand. Then they used to have promotion. Did they do it in Kenya? They will do promo and say, if you drink, open the cup and peel it, you will see a gift if you are lucky. You remember the promotions? So when you now open Mirinda or you open 7-Up, bam, you turn the cup, you open that white thing in there, you will see either, either two bottles, five bottles, or you will see a car. Is that true? Or television set. So everybody will be drinking and opening to see if we can get. Then they now tell you, if you find a car on the cab, keep it. On Saturday at the weekend, bring it to the collection center. Now when you take that cab, that is the guarantee for your gift. If you lose it, you didn't win anything. And if your friend steal it from you, it doesn't have a name. The name is the one in possession of it. If I beat you on the road and I collect it, you have no way to prove that it's yours. It is who has it that it belongs to. How many of you remember those days? So now you take it there on a particular Saturday. You give them the cup. They take it and give you the gift in exchange. True or false? So now you have redeemed the gift. You have redeemed the cup. That's what the redemption here is. That Jesus, when he bought you, put his spirit in you. To stay in you till the day of redemption. So on the day of redemption, this your body is the cup. It's been bought with a price. And the spirit is living in it to seal it. On the day of rapture, 
you will give this your body in exchange for the other one. That's why people who die, we don't destroy their body. We bury it well. Because on the day of resurrection, that their body in the grave will rise to be exchanged for the other body. Mortality, putting up immortality, or it is called the resurrection. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. So now, in whom also you trusted, after that you had the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed. You are not sealed until you believe. It is at the point of believing you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now look at the next verse. Which is the earnest? The down payment. He gave all shatter. The Spirit is the down payment. Or the Spirit is the guarantee. Or the Spirit is the guarantor. That you will be redeemed. Now the redemption will be the complete redemption. Right now you are redeemed spirit, soul, body is coming. The redemption of the body is what we call the resurrection. Which is the earnest? Give me amplified, brother. Ah, Shato Balaya. That spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. The first fruits, the pledge, and for oh, what a foretaste! foretaste the down payment on our heritage in anticipation of his full redemption and our acquiring complete possession of it to the praise of his glory is it adding up the spirit of god in you is the seal of eternal salvation you can't lose the spirit when you say lose salvation, what you mean is losing the spirit. You can't lose the spirit, you can't lose salvation. The spirit will be in you forever. Some say, but David prayed, cast me not away from your presence, O oh God. Take not your holy spirit. Did you go to school? He didn't say, you have taken away your Holy Spirit. He said, take not. That means even in that scene, the Spirit was still with him. That is even in the Old Testament. He didn't say you took it. He said, take not. That means it was still with him. And that is why after that, he still continued to prophesy. Because the spirit was still with him. As a prophet in the Old Testament. Are we in the building? To say you lose salvation is to mean you lose the spirit. Some say, so you mean when I sin, the spirit doesn't live. Where is he living to? Is he afraid of sin? The spirit of God is not afraid of sin. He destroys sin. If something is created to destroy glasses, what will the team be looking for? Because when there are no glasses, it is jobless. The machine that is designed to destroy glasses will be happy when you line up glasses. Because then it can carry out its purpose. The spirit of God is designed to damage sin. So it goes around looking for sin to damage. He doesn't leave you. He will abide with you forever. Oh, glory to God. I'm teaching good. Say with me, I am sealed. Say my redemption is guaranteed. Say, I am secured in Christ Jesus. I didn't hear a good amen. amen. Now back to Ephesians chapter 2. Where we came from. Chapter 2 verse 4. By God, but God who is rich in mercy. 
For his great love wherewith he loved us. Did you observe the tenses are all past? Love wherewith he loved us. Next verse. Even when we were dead, we are, we are, we are no more. We were, but we are no more. Dead in sins at what? Quickened us. Quickened us together. Quickened us how? So when Jesus rose, what happened? We rose. When he died, what happened? We died. When he ascended, what happened? We ascended. When he sat down, what happened? We are seated. It's identification. He didn't do it for him. He did it for us. So when it was happening to him, it was happening to us. We are the beneficiaries of his work. I'm teaching good here. He says he had quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. Next verse. And hath raised us up how? And made us sit how? So together, together, together. The Greek word suk. Katizo. So katizo means you will never find one without the other. It's, it's like scrambled eggs. When you scramble eggs, you can't remove white from yellow. We and Christ are scrambled together. Where he is, I am. Where I am, he is. What he has, I have. What I have, he has. What he can do, I can do. What I can do, he can do. We are, we are intertwined. Am I teaching? This is your identity I am putting before you. That's why brother Paul will now pray. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 16. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What prayer are you praying brother Paul? for the church that the god of our lord jesus christ the father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom that and is which is is kai the spirit of wisdom which is revelation so wisdom is revelation revelation is wisdom they are not two is the same it's just for the explanation Wisdom, which is revelation, where? In the knowledge of him. If you observe the epistles, all prayers were for knowledge. There was no prayer for things. That's not the focus of the believer. Things are not our focus. God forbid that I should fast and pray. For what an unbeliever gets without prayer. No, you didn't hear me. I want to say it again. God forbid that I should be fasting and praying. For what a man that is not born again is getting without prayer. Unbelievers buy cars without prayer. January is by the corner. Many Christians, when they say prayer requests for the new year, car, house, wife, twins, triplets, visa to America. Visa to China. Is it China or Japan? <laughs> Glory! Glory! Favor, employment, businesses. Yet unbelievers get them without prayer. Which doctors buy cars without thinking? And you are fasting. Father, do it now. Do it now. Oh my God. Do it again. You did it before. You did it for Daniel. You did it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do it again. Are you not on the throne? Did you overthrow him? What was your problem, my friend? What was your problem? You don't need prayer for what an unbeliever gets without prayer. Now let me ask you. You and the unbeliever, who should pray? The unbeliever, not you. But when your focus is wrong, your prayers will be wrong. And the reason why your focus is wrong is because you fed on the wrong diet. Take no thought what you shall eat. Take no thought what you shall wear. For after these things do the Gentiles seek. But your father knows that you have need of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things. I know I'm preaching good this afternoon. Take no thought for these things. Once a preacher is materialistic, his doctrine will be colored. 
Once a preacher is mammon driven, once you are in love with money, you will worship money. And the worship of money will reflect in your doctrinal persuasion. Many preachers don't want to preach this message because they are in love with money. You cannot serve God and mammon. So you have to choose who to serve. As a preacher, you are either serving God or you are serving mammon. Who is your God? Mammon is idolatry. You see that? <laughs> Look at what Paul will say to Timothy. First Timothy, chapter 6, verse 3. Brother Paul is talking to a young pastor who is a bishop. He says, if any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words. What are wholesome words? Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the words of our Lord Jesus Christ? And to the doctrine which is according to godliness. You know what godliness? Godliness is eusubia in the Greek. It means our view of God in Christ. Godliness means we see God in Christ. That's the meaning of godliness. That our view of God is Christ. That when we think of God, what we think of is Christ. That's godliness. That's why he now says, he now says, he now says, and without controversy, great is the mysterion of Eusubia. The mystery of godliness. That is, great is our view of God in Christ. I'm teaching good. Our view of God is in Christ. So, if any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome. The word wholesome is the Greek word hugaino. H-U-G-I-A-N-O. N-A. I mean, oh. Hugaino. Hugaino means healthy. Healthy. Hugaino means sound. Sound doctrine. Healthy doctrine. Wholesome doctrine. Wholesome words. What is wholesome doctrine? The words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The doctrine which is according to godliness. See that? And there are preachers who don't care about the doctrine to godliness. Their focus is ancestral curses. Because it is close to Africanization. So it makes sense for those who walk by sight. I was preaching in America, Pastor Karenja, and I didn't know that the, a deliverance expert, one of their champions on deliverance in America, accidentally was in that meeting. And he was sitting in front with some of his victims. Too bad, man. Some of his victims were in the meeting. And I began to teach the gospel powerfully. And I told them, you don't need deliverance as a child of God. Any preacher doing you deliverance is taking advantage of your ignorance. And I went, wow, 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 wow. Then I started bringing scriptures. I destroyed that table to the, to the point where you don't see the ashes of the table. Yeah, you can't even see the legs. The whole thing was smashed. The man started frowning. He looked at me. If he had a gun, he would have shot me, man. He was bitter because market is going. And the victims were screaming, yes, man of God. Yes, sir. It's the, the whole thing was too bad, man. As soon as I finished, as my custom is, any question, his hand was up. He stood up and said, Dr. Domina, I think you are not sound when it comes to deliverance. Those of us that have been in this deliverance, we have a lot of experiences to share. I'm still waiting for him. In fact, I'm smiling at this time because the whole thing is a joke for me. He said, you know, we've delivered people who are pastors and they manifested. We've delivered even music ministers and they've been rolling on the floor. And when we finished deliverance, things got better for them. Dr. Damina, I'm sure you've never heard of incubus and sickibus. 
when a girl sleeps and a man is having sex with her, it is incubus. And when a girl is having sex with a man in his dream, it is sickibus. Spiritual husband and spiritual wife with children. That's why some women have children in the dream, but they don't have physically because it's spiritual. Dr. Damina, I think you don't know these things. I said, my goodness. Then I asked him, I said, which scripture supports in kibbutz and sickibus? I said, even from the Old Testament, twist any scripture and just support in kibbutz and sickibus. I'm sure before that guy started preaching, I already knew about sickibus and in kibbutz. I read about in kibbutz and sickibus 1984. 84. I'm not sure he was born again. It was written by a woman called Rebecca Brown. That's when we read those materials. And we used them. They had something called Semiramis. Ashmodi. Ashterod. Well, I was there. I did all that nonsense, man. Until I found it was rubbish. So I now said to the guy, give me a scripture for incubus and I'm sure you'll never forget Incubus and Sigibus <laughs> in Eldoret. <laughs> he was looking at me, no scripture, only experiences. Then I said to him, are, we, are you aware, if you're well learned, that we do not build Bible doctrine on experience? Bible doctrine is built on scripture, not experience. Experiences are subject to scripture. Scripture is not subject to experiences. Therefore, you don't relate experiences when being doctrinal. He was looking at me. Then I gave him five, seven scriptures. And I killed it with another scripture. Where Jesus said, a certain man was married to a woman and he died. She married a second brother, third brother, to the fifth brother, to the seventh brother. All of them died. Then they asked Jesus, whose, host, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For they all had her. Jesus said to them, have you not read Anaginosko? Have you not read? That is, have you not read with understanding? Have you not read paying attention that in the resurrection there is no marriage? Everybody will be like the angels. Which means angels don't marry. Which means you can't have a spiritual husband. And you cannot have a spiritual wife because angels don't have sex. Sex is physical. There's no spiritual sex. So no demon is having sex with you if you have sex in the dream. You are having sex by yourself. And the reason why you're having sex is because you've been watching sex too much. It has registered in your subconscious and is playing back. And that face you saw is just a face because there has to be a face your subconscious is creating that will engage you. Somebody said, but when I had the sex, I even was able to have some, some, some releases. Yes, because your subconscious controls your emotions. Okay, let me give another, another illustration. I'm helping somebody. What about the young boy who played ball in the afternoon? He played ball. He played ball. He played ball. Then in the night, this small boy, Junior, is sleeping. Then Junior stands up. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. And the mother holds him. Junior, Junior, lie down. I need the ball. Then he discovers, no, he's still sleeping. Then he lays back to sleep. It was so real that he stood up. It was so real that he was kicking. It was so real that his mother grabbed him. He was still trying to get the ball. Is Junior possessed? What happens to Junior? He played in the afternoon till he entered his subconscious. So in the night, it played back and it was real. No demon. Many of you, they use your experiences to, to bewitch you. And then you believe because it agrees with your experience. Somebody says, I saw myself flying in the dream and may be possessed. Who told you? Which verse says, and when thou flyest, thou art possessed? 
The only verse I see in scripture that is connected to flying is they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings. So if you're flying, fly higher. Because when you mount up with wings, what do you do next? You fly. Uh, that's destroying some deliverance tables now. Some say, but I, I've been eating in the dream. You're eating? Eat more. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Anytime you see yourself eating the dream, ask for more. <laughs> Tell them, I came to lie down. I didn't ask for food. You brought food. Then you have to bring more. Because now that you have steered me up to eating, I want to eat everything. Bring continental, bring Kenyan local food, bring Nigerian jello rice, bring Ghana jello rice. I want to eat everything. So I say, are you, why are you encouraging us to eat? Thou preparest a table before me where? So when they prepare a table, what do you do? There's no scriptural doctrinal teaching that says when you eat in the dream, you're possessed. There's no such thing. Moreover, you're eating because you like food. That's why it's playing back. <laughs> when I finished with this man, he was quiet. But that was the end of his ministry among those people. Because those people saw the truth. Are you still here? Those words are not wholesome. Brother Paul says it must be wholesome. Who gaino sound healthy. And healthy will be the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The words of who? Put up that first Timothy chapter 6, verse number 4 now. Oh, go back to verse 3 again so that they can follow the thought. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud. Knowing nothing. The man doesn't know anything. It's because you too don't know. That's why you're following him. It's a case of blind men leading blind men. Knowing nothing but doting about questions and strife of words. Whereof commit envy and strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Anybody preaching Semiramis, Incubus, Sikibus is a destitute dead person. The person is destitute. He's depraved. He's depraved of truth. Because when you have the truth, you don't celebrate those things. Those things mean nothing. When you have the truth, you don't even make Satan an issue. You can pray for a week without calling Satan. Because you know the truth. When your prayer is full of Satan, you are a victim of ignorance. Why should Satan call all your prayer? Are you praying to Satan or to God? And if you are talking with God, why is Satan coming in between? Is God afraid of Satan? I'm teaching good. Some people every morning they wake up, Satan, fire, blood, kerosene. What for? This is the day that the Lord has made. My steps are ordered by the Lord. The lines are falling to me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. My going out is blessed. My coming in is blessed. Where is Satan? You are destitute of the truth because you have been paying attention to fables. Old wife fables. Now watch this. This is where the problem is. <laughs> hey. I tell you I feel this thing Can you feel what I feel yeah. Destitute of the truth Supposing That gain Is godliness From such From such Don't go to that church again 
Don't sit under that pastor. Don't relate to that pastor. Any pastor that supposes that gain is godliness, run from him. You know what gain is godly, godliness? It's a doctrine that celebrates testimonies. Praise the Lord. I just came to this church one week now. The second new car is outside. I just joined this commission two weeks ago. Right now, I just bought a house. You have attributed Christianity to materialism. What you are projecting is the true approval of God is material world. Bible says you are destitute. Breakthrough service. Sow a seed for breakthrough. You are destitute of the truth. Your offering will remove your suffering. You are destitute of the truth. A seed will meet every need. You are destitute of the truth. Very funny. Give me the New Living Translation. Hey! New Living, I love New Living Translation. <laughs> These people always cause trouble. Their minds are what? Corrupt. They are like corrupt politicians. And they don't tell the truth. To them, religion is just a way to get rich. We are teaching good? They only come to God for things. Come to Jesus. You will never have a problem. That's a lie. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. It is even when you come to Jesus that trouble will start. So if it is to run away from trouble, don't come to Jesus. Maybe Satan may help you better. At least he will deceive you. He will collect your leg and give you a hand. They use religion as a, 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 a vehicle for wealth. $35. Psalm 35 for 35 blessings. 2022. 20, 2,220 shillings to prosper. They are going to come very soon. Just watch. Let the new year start. You will hear these things. 22 what? 22 blessings this year. So, $2,222. If it doesn't pain you, it cannot benefit you. No pain, no gain. Nonsense. Christ is more than enough. Christ is my gain. Christ is my sufficiency. Christ is my blessing. Shout glory! I'm teaching good? I think we should come to Eldoret next year and do a crusade. Gather the whole city and tell them the truth and let them decide for themselves. Religion in their mind is a way to make money. Say from such people. Don't go to that kind of church. Run away. Escape. Sit down, let me tell you something. How many of you know? How many of you? Can I talk to you? How many of you know Jesus didn't come to make you rich? How many of you know Jesus didn't come to make you rich? How many of you know Jesus didn't come to make you rich? The richest man on earth today is Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. The thing is within two of them. It's within the two of them. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Two of them don't believe in God. They don't care about your Christ. They are not interested in God. Yet they are the richest. 
they are going to the moon now and they are going to Mars. They want to create space in Mars where some of them will go and live because this world is too dirty for them. They are building spaceships. They are flying out of sp into, into sp outer space. I think it was Jeff Bezos about a month ago who came back from space and took out $200 million. Walked to two people. One is a radio TV pre presenter and said, take $100 million. I just like what you've been doing. You also take $100 million. $200 million. You are giving to people as if you are giving peanuts because they have too much money. They don't know what to do with it. Yet they don't know Christ. No tight payer can match them. You are not hearing what I'm saying. No tight payer. If tight is really the doorway to blessing. All these titers. Why haven't they prospered more than these non-titers? Does it mean that God is not serious? The Chinese people are making too much wealth. They don't even go to church. Many gods. Let's stop this calm and get serious. Jesus didn't come to make you rich. Before Jesus came, people were rich. So that's not why he came. He didn't come to give you properties. Before he came, they were properties. He didn't come to make you wealthy. Before he came, they were wealthy people. Even in his time, they were wealthy people. That's why he related with somebody like Lazarus, I mean, like uh, Zacchaeus. He was a wealthy man, but he was brief. So he climbed a tree to see Jesus. Jesus said, brief man, come down. Today, salvation has come to your house. Okay, let me say short now, since you don't like brief. Are we sitting here? Jesus followed this man to his house. And the disciples were saying, Jesus doesn't know this man. If Jesus knows this man, he won't go to his house. Because the guy became wealthy by oppressing the poor. He was a shrewd businessman. And he, he oppressed people and got wealthy. And you know, most wealthy men are like that. Even Father Abraham, you are so-called father. He was a corrupt businessman. Oh, you don't know? Ah, Abraham was corrupt. How did he become rich? He traded in his wife. He took his wife and said, you know, you are very beautiful. Let's not waste your beauty. <laughs> Let's package it for export. <laughs> Let's package your beauty for export. When we go to this king, tell him you are my sister. Okay? If not, they will kill me. He's a businessman. He has set up. I asked to convince the wife. They will kill me. You don't want to be a widow. The wife said, okay, no problem. Smart guy. Who are you? He's my brother. Okay, go into my bedroom. Brother, you stay in the guest room. An angel said, don't touch her. She's the wife of a prophet. Prophet? She said, wife? Why did you lie to me? Why did you lie to me? He said, give her back to him with gifts. Export has finished. Shipment has been done. Payment is been done. <laughs> Am I teaching somebody here? Yeah. That's how Abraham became rich. Now, you see, when the Bible says, follow the steps of Abraham, he's not talking about the step of Abraham in material wealth. The step of Abraham in believing in justification by faith. Okay, let me prove it to you. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. Are you getting blessed tonight? Yes. We'll go back to Timothy. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. Watch this. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, had found? What's the big deal about Abraham? What makes him thick? Next verse. For, next verse, if Abraham were justified. So the big deal about Abraham is what? Justification. If he were justified by works, he had wear off to glory, but not before God. Next verse. For what say of the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for what? Righteousness. 
So the big deal about Abraham is righteousness without works. Righteousness devoid of works. Righteousness by faith. For what said the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted or credited unto him for righteousness. Next verse. Oh, now to him that worketh not, but is the reward not reckoned of grace. He that worketh, the reward is not grace. It is debt. If I have to use my works to qualify, it means I'm paying a debt I cannot pay. So I don't use my works. I resign. Let Jesus' works justify me. Amen. Somebody shout grace. grace. Alright, next verse. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith. Say with me, I believe. I'm righteous. Say it again, I believe. I'm righteous. Say it louder, I believe. I'm righteous. How are you righteous? What do you believe? You believe Christ. And that makes you what? That's all. It's not works. It's not works. You know, somebody said to me somewhere. He was trying to get me doctrinally in a corner. He doesn't know that I understood where he was going. He said, but brother James says, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. That means even if you have faith, you have to add works. That means if you believe in Jesus, you have to do something for you to be righteous. No, that's not what James was teaching. James was teaching conduct after salvation. That now that you are, you are saved, Christ is in you. There should be Christ in you reflecting. Then he said, Abraham offered Isaac and by it he was justified. That's not true. Abraham's justification was in Genesis chapter 15 verse 6. That's why he was justified. Are you following? And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. Then he offered Isaac in chapter 22. So it's not the offering of Isaac that made him justified. It is because he was justified that he now offered Isaac in response to his justification. So we don't give to be justified. We are justified. And in gratitude, we give. I'm teaching good. So don't let anybody put you in a corner. See that? Believe on him that justified the ungodly. His faith is credited for righteousness. Put up the next verse for me. That Romans chapter 4. Even as David also described the blessedness. So the blessing is the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. So what's the blessing? It's not car and houses. The blessing is that God looks at you without doing anything but believing on Christ and God says you are righteous. Once you are righteous by faith, you are blessed. That's a blessing. That is true riches. That is true riches. True riches is that God will see me as one who has never done wrong before. Because I believe in Jesus. And he will treat me at that level of innocence. That's the riches. Are you still here? Now, follow this. Next verse, verse 7. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. That's the blessing. My sins are gone. My sins are gone. I'm not a sinner. Which means our justification is by faith. Which also means sound gospel has no material coloration. Sound gospel has no material coloration. Because if you get back to 1 Timothy chapter 6 where we are, 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt mind and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Next verse. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You know what Paul is saying here? That our contentment is godliness. You didn't hear that. Our contentment is that we have seen God in Christ. We are satisfied. Money or no money. 
That's true contentment. True contentment is not to be the richest person in Kenya. Where are you going with it? Right now you die, your money will be scattered a million directions. So avoid benefit. And in eternity, you will not be seen as a rich man. You'll be seen as a pauper. Because what has eternal value is souls in the kingdom. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is God's heartbeat. Souls, evangelism, discipleship. That is the treasure in heaven. It's not accumulation of wealth. That doesn't mean you should make money. Make as much as you can. Share some with me. But that's not our focus. That's not our focus. Our focus is Christ. And in Christ we are contented. And if we do business, we do to the best of our ability. We don't kill to make it. We made it already. I'm teaching good. Contentment. And let me tell you, if you are contented, you will never fall a victim of scam. People that are scammed are greedy people. When you are greedy, you will be scammed. You're not hearing me. <laughs> when you don't have contentment, you will be scammed. A man that is contented, mm -mm, nothing moves you until you want to move yourself. I'm teaching good tonight. Say with me, godliness is contentment. Then look at what Brother Paul now says a believer should have as wealth. Next verse. For we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we carry nothing out. Next verse. Oh, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So once you can wear clothes and eat food, you are rich in God. Through definition. And a child of God and a man of God should be contented with having food and clothes. Of course, you can make more money. But you shouldn't feel bad if you don't make more money. It's a good thing to make money. Go to school. Join, do businesses. Make money. Oh yeah, if you become the richest man in Ghana, we'll be, I mean in Kenya, we'll be happy. But that's not your pursuit. Your pursuit is Christ. Your pursuit is Christ. The more you know Christ, the more you want to know him. Brother Paul says that I may know him. You know when Paul said that I may know him, it was after 30 years of ministry. After 30 years of ministry, then Paul started a prayer that I may know him. <laughs> you don't understand. <laughs> because with God, the more you know him, the more you know you don't know, the more you want to know. The day you think you know all, then you don't know nothing. Because the deeper you dig, the deeper it gets. The more you know, the more you want to know. The more you seek to know. So your prayer points in 2022 cannot be cars and houses. Your prayer points in 2022 is that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. That you may know the hope of your calling. That you may fulfill your ministry. That you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing so you can be fruitful unto every good work. Someone says, so what about business? Shouldn't we pray for business? You just thank God for direction. Lord, I receive direction as I go forth. Thank you for favor. Glory to God. Amen. That's it. That's it. Not father, if you don't do it. If you don't do it, then I will know you are not on the throne. Who are you intimidating? God is not moved. He's God by himself. Whether you acknowledge him or not. What if some don't believe? Will their unbelief make the word of God of none effect? He said, God forbid. You believe, you enjoy. You don't believe, you suffer. It's your business. God doesn't benefit from your faith. You benefit. You didn't hear what I said. It's all for you. Sound doctrine is the teaching of Christ without the coloration of material wealth. Christ and Christ alone. Without the coloration of other things. The doctrine which is according to godliness. You are seated with Christ. That's enough celebration. You are blessed. Your sins are forgiven. What is bigger than that? 
You are enriched in him in all things. Oh, I love brother Paul. Look at how brother Paul explains the blessing. Ephesians chapter 1 verse, 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 verse 3. I will soon be done and I will take questions. Are you blessed? Yes. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who had blessed, blessed, blessed is that futuristic or past? Blessed us with how many? Spiritual. I know sometimes preachers will tell you your blessings are in the spirit in order for you to withdraw and convert them to the physical. There are certain things to be done. Scam. <laughs> Your blessings are in the spiritual. There are portals, there are realms, there are depths, and there are dimensions. You can never enter without certain steps. Fraud. Nothing is deeper than in Christ. That's where you are. No portal is portal than Christ. Christ is your portal. Am I teaching? And some of these crazy things they come from my country. And then in Kenya, you now take it to the next level. <laughs> we give you the basics and then you flourish it. Am I teaching good? Say, so, you know, your blessings are in the spiritual. Yeah, your blessings are in the spiritual. There are things to do to convert your blessings from the spiritual to the material. Number one, you sow a seed that moves you. Because if your seed don't move you, it cannot move God. <laughs> You guys in Eldoret, you're born again. <laughs> and Isaac sowed in that same year. He ripped a hundredfold. You've got to show, show some seed. Yeah. It's coming up at this time. Yes. December to remember. December to remember. Raise four altars. Raise four altars. You know those altar people? There are many altars. Fraud. The only altar you have is Christ. There's no altar outside Christ. Glory to God. Say with me, I am in him justified. He is in me glorified. I thought he would shout glory. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who, who will, who will, who will, who will, who hath what? Blessed us with how many? All what? Spiritual blessings. Where are the blessings? In heavenly. Where is heavenly? In Christ. See, in the original, it's not heavenly places. There are no places in the original. That's why it's in italics. If, if you put places there, it means God has plenty bomb bombs. Bombs, bombs in places. So that's why the places is not correct. It shouldn't be there. Okay? It should be blessings in heavenly, in Christ. Because the heavenly euphrenius is in Christ. The word heavenly is immaterial. Immaterial. So he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the immaterial and the immaterial is in Christ. Is it getting clear? So brother Paul help us. What is the blessing? What is the blessing? According as he has chosen us. That's the first blessing. The first blessing is that we are chosen. In him. Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy. And without blame before him where? In love. That's the first blessing. He enumerates it. He didn't leave it for you to be using it to say convert. He explained what he was just talking about in verse 3 in verse 4. Post text. Look at the next post text. Verse 5. Having predestinated us. That's the second blessing. 
predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Next verse, next blessing. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he had made us accepted where? In the beloved. That's the next blessing. It has nothing to do with cars and houses. Thieves have houses. Scammers have cars. That's not the blessing. Some of them have houses in Dubai, America, Japan, and yet they are scammers. That cannot be the blessing. Am I teaching? There was a guy come out of Nigeria, was very popular on social media. You know, uh, he's, he was arrested by America. I think they call him Hush Poppy or something. Hush Poppy? Hush pop, Poppy? The guy had wealth, too much money. He would just sit down in very expensive stuff and make pictures and put them on Instagram. And a lot of young people were, were just, you know, celebrating his wealth. And then they discovered that he was coming people everywhere to be in that luxury. The FBI went to Dubai and picked him up. He's under custody in America. Where are those pictures now? Because what this world gives you, this world will take. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nothing this world gives you is eternal. It does not last. So that's why our blessings in Christ cannot be accessed by unbelievers. Our blessings are in Christ. You can only access them where? In Christ. Our blessings is what unbelievers cannot access. Once unbelievers can access it, it's not our blessing. They can access cars. They can access money. They can access wealth. You know, under the COVID lockdown, a lot of people became multi-billionaires. So many became poor. The COVID made many people rich and made many people poor. That's the world system. The world system is controlled by men, not controlled by God. The economic forces are controlled by men, not God. So that's why a believer's heart cannot be on wealth, it should be on Christ. A man's life does not possess in the abundance of things he possesses. If our hope is only in this world, we are of all men most miserable. So as a preacher, as a child of God, your contentment should not be in things. Your contentment should be in him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't let things define you. Let him define you. Yes, sir. You have money, glory. You don't have money, glory. I'm teaching good. That's who you are in Christ. So, Brother Paul keeps explaining our, our blessings. Next verse, Ephesians 1. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to what? So, the riches of God are his grace. But you know, when you say, now I preach grace, these legalists have come up with a version of grace. Grace to travel. Grace to marry. But you must activate it. Tap grace. Like you tap palm wine. The grace to respect. Yes. Any grace you don't respect, you don't attract. They are twisting the grace. So that they too, it will be said they are preaching grace. Grace is not in things. Grace is a person. Jesus is grace. There's nothing like grace to travel. There's nothing like grace for prosperity. Does Elon Musk have grace for prosperity? What of Jeff Bezos? Do they have grace for prosperity? Grace for prosperity. And the man preaching grace for prosperity, if you look at him, he needs prosperity. And he's saying you should tap it from him. Oh, they won't like this thing I'm doing today. Oh my goodness. Eldoret, what are you guys doing to me? I was walking in an airport to go and preach somewhere. And a young man saw me who has been admiring me for long. He ran with a bundle of money. 
And he said, oh, Dr. Demina, Dr. Demina, please take, I tap grace. I said, no, 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 keep it. We don't tap. It's not palm wine. He was holding the money and looking at me. I didn't take it. We don't tap. It's not palm wine. I said, if you want the grace you see in my life, read my books. Listen to my teachings. Because grace and peace is multiplied through knowledge. Then he looked at me. But he was still holding the money. So I said, but in case you want to give me this money badly. Don't give me to tap. Give me because you honor my labor. In word and doctrine. He said, exactly, that's what I'm doing, sir. I took the money. I said, do you have more? If you have more, bring more. <laughs> Glory! Glory! If you have more, bring. He said, no, this is all for now. I said, don't forget. You say for now. That means there will be more later. I said to him, be blessed. And thank you for honoring me. Stand up. Have a great day. I'm not going to take money from you on falsehood. I'm going to put the record straight. Before I take your money. Because money has not stolen my heart. Christ is in my heart. He wanted to tap, tap what? So if all of you tap my grace, where will, where will I have another one? How many grace do I have? That everybody is tapping it. So after tap, 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 the battery will run down. And there is no charger. <laughs> Glory! The grace is in the word of God. You sit down and study the scriptures. And as you grow in knowledge, you grow in grace. Grace and peace be multiplied through the knowledge. Grow in knowledge, grow in grace. These two days you've been here. Do you know how much grace has grown in your life? As the word keeps coming and you're drinking it in. And things are happening on your inside in your spirit. Grace is being unleashed. You walk out of here and, and you begin to pray at another level. You walk out of here, you have an understanding of things at another level. Your worldview is changing. How you deal with humans is changing. Your relationship with God is changing. That is grace. Not some spooky stuff that you buy with money. You know, Simon the Sorcerer was the founder of Prosperity Gospel. In Acts chapter 8. That's where he started from. When he saw the power of God. He said wow I want to tap. I want to tap. He brought a bag of money. He said take this money and give me power. Peter said you and your money go and perish. Because you cannot buy the power or the gift of God. The guy said oh. Please pray for me. Because these things you have spoken are too heavy for me. That means the apostles were very rugged in dealing with materialism. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They could not be bought. So that is why you see a church like Macedonia. Because they understood Christ in the depth of their poverty. The liberality of their generosity abounded. How can a man be in deep poverty and his giving is radical? Other than he has understood Christ. The church, yes, minor. Poor but rich in revelation. And the other church is rich. They think they are rich, but they don't know that they are poor, they are naked, and they are blind. Oh yes, he's outside, not clear. That's why we don't define believers by wealth. James says you are carnal if rich people come to your church and you put them in front and put poor people at the back. Yes. He said that church doesn't even know Christ. <laughs> my biggest title sits beside me. This is the biggest partner of my ministry. Give him a seat here. This man is the political advisor to the president. Give him a seat here. The other brother doesn't have a good shop. Keep him at the door. <laughs> he's, an yeah, he's an intercessor. Let them be interceded. They are of no financial value. We're teaching good tonight. Yeah. Peter
Peter said, you and your money go and perish. You cannot buy the gift of God with money. You don't buy it. You don't buy it. It's too expensive. The richest thing in life are all freely given. The air you breathe, God didn't charge you. Your life, you sleep and wake up. When you are sleeping, you don't know where you are. One leg is in south, the other leg is in west. Your neck is in east. Your waist is in north. Yet you wake up in the morning looking like you are in charge. You didn't pay any debt. You paid no fee. You didn't even buy subscription. The richest things are poor. I mean, the richest things are free. God's blessing is free. Christ is free. Health is free. God has given us the richest things for free. Freely. Are you blessed tonight? Say with me, I do not buy the grace of God. Say it very loud, I do not buy the grace of God. Because the grace of God cannot be bought. I am what I am by the grace of God. The grace of God has made me. I am made. I'm not trying to be made. I'm already made by grace. I didn't hear a good amen. So the next time a preacher says, God will make you tell him, thank you, sir. God has made me. God will make you know, sir, I am made. God is about. He has about finish. He has finished about. <laughs> God is about, no, he has finished about. <laughs> God is about to know, sir. He has finished about. <laughs> that about, he has finished. <laughs> Glory! Yeah. One man said to me, Dr. Damina, you know your messages are very profound. The only thing is we don't like the way you say it. You will now say it and be laughing. I say, okay, I'm sorry. What should I be doing? He says, say it calm. <laughs> and don't laugh. <laughs> I say, but what I'm saying is good news. Why wouldn't I laugh when I'm speaking good news? <laughs> Anyhow, I say it. If you love truth, you will take it. There's no way to say truth other than to say it. I just say it. It's only lie you have to look for how to say. <laughs> when you want to lie, you have to look for how to say it. But truth, you just say it. Because it is the way it is. Glory to God. First Timothy, as I close the service, glory to God, chapter 6, verse number 7. First Timothy 6, 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Next verse. Therefore, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. You know, some preachers will say, but the Bible says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Even though he was rich, yet for your poverty, he became poor. That you might be rich. Okay? You know the grace. They use that to raise money. <laughs> he became poor that you may be rich. So if you want to be rich, you have to tap. What Paul was saying is that Christ was rich in glory. But when he saw you deprived of glory and have fallen short of glory, he became poor by removing his glory and descending into humanity so that he can take you up to his glory. It has nothing to do with money. So that means the grace of God is that I deprive myself to enrich you. Grace is not accumulation. Grace is deprivation for somebody's enrichment. Grace is not you giving to me. Grace is me depriving myself to better you. That's what Macedonia did. In their deep poverty, the liberality of their generosity abounded. This they did, not as we hoped. But first of all, they gave themselves to the Lord, then to us. And they begged us not to reject their gift. So when brethren grow in grace, their giving explodes. 
when you grow in grace you don't grow in stinginess you grow in liberality you give more you know when I started saying in the New Testament no tithing people are clapping for me Dr. Damina you are the best oh Dr. Damina you are God sent you really are a man of God because they thought I was teaching believers to be stingy meanwhile tithing is the lowest form of stinginess because tithing is 10 percent you give the 10 keep 90 because you save yourself you are doing god a favor to give him 10 because you gave your life to him you know they gave their life to christ you understand so because they gave their life to christ that's a favor they did christ at least they gave christ a life so after they gave christ a life they, then they gave god 10 percent god should be grateful that's that gospel but when you know that you have no life until christ came i am come that you may have life and that you may be abundant i gave christ no life christ gave me his life so i and what i have we belong to christ i cannot keep anything from christ he is the lord of my life so i give him everything in the grace of God, we give until the need is met. You didn't hear that. We keep giving until the need is met. Because grace is about meeting needs. Not my need, but the need of the order. Or the need of the gospel. That's grace. Grace is distribution. Grace is distribution. Not accumulation. A millionaire is not one who has gathered a million shillings. A millionaire is whose life has affected a million people. Yeah. Millionaire status is impact, not accumulation. Yes, sir. yes. When through your giving, this church reaches Eldoret. When through your giving, the gospel reaches Kenya. That makes you a millionaire. Because your life has affected millions. It's not accumulation. The gospel of grace is not a gospel of stinginess. It's a gospel of generosity. Tight is stinginess. It's stinginess. Somebody said, but Abraham gave tight. Under the promise. You are in the fulfilled promise. Why should you and Abraham be struggling? Sir, under the law. Blood of bulls and goats, they pay 10%. You under the blood of Christ, you want to pay 10%? People under blood of goats are paying 10%. You under Christ's blood, you want to pay for as much as you know. That you are not purchased with corruptible things, such as silver and gold. But by the precious, that means the precious blood of Christ, you should do more. Yeah. To whom much is given? Our gospel is not a gospel of stinginess. It's a gospel of generosity. You can deprive yourself and give to the work of God and you are happy. And let me tell you, when we understand this grace message, there will be so much generosity in the church that the work of God will be done with ease. And believers will be blessed across the board. Yeah. If you understand the message. Because in Acts of the Apostles, they didn't pay tithe because tithe was too small. Nobody paid tithe in the book of Acts. Because that was when Pentecost came. They were in fresh love with the Holy Ghost. They were excited about what God has made available to them. So you know what they did? They sold everything and brought everything. It's called grace giving. Grace giving is generosity. Glory to God. You come to a conference like this, you walk to Pastor Karanja. What did it cost you to put this conference together? I'm going to pay 70%. Because this meeting is blessing people. And I'm just happy to be a part of those making it available. That is grace. That is grace. Not that you take a careless change somewhere and say, anyway. No, that's not grace. That's law. The God, I gave you 5,000 shillings. 
I need, I need it back first before I give the next one. That's transaction. That's Ponzi scheme. And God doesn't have one. I'm teaching good. All of us that are believers in grace-based churches, let's get generous. Law preachers have plenty of money because they intimidate people to collect it. If you don't pay your tight, it will be tight. If you don't pay your tight, there are curses coming on you. Your car will break down. Your children could be sick. You are cursed with a curse. So people out of fear, they keep giving. Close your bank account so God can open a new bank account. Yes, Lord. Here we don't intimidate you. We show you Christ. And your revelation of Christ determines your generosity. When you see Jesus, money loses value. If money still has value with you, you are far from Christ. When you see Christ, money loses value. I can prove it to you. Jesus was on a donkey riding to Jerusalem. When the people saw Christ on the donkey, they said, wow. They brought out their gold, their jewelry. They put all on the floor for Jesus to ride upon. Zacchaeus, when Jesus sat to eat with him, the Bible says Zacchaeus stood up. Nobody preached to him. I'm sure it dawned on Zacchaeus that this is Jesus Christ. Zacchaeus said, me, a sinner, this man could come to my house and eat. He stood up, gentlemen, anybody I have cheated, I will pay times four. Money no more had value for him. Because he saw Christ. The woman at the well said to Jesus, what have we got in common? Why should I give you water? I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. We have nothing in common. Jesus says, if only you knew the gift of God. What Jesus said, I'm the gift of God. You will give me your water that you drink and you're thirsty. I will give you water you drink and never thirst. He said, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well? Jesus said, this woman needs to know who she's talking with. You have five husbands. And even the fifth one is not your husband. Eh? No, no, no. This is the Messiah. Take the bucket. Take the well. Then she ran to the city and brought the city. When you see Jesus, money loses value. The songwriter said, when all things that surround becomes shadows in the light of you. Glory to God. As we leave this conference today, we stand in the truth. Somebody say wholesome words. The words of our Lord Jesus. That's what we preach. We preach wholesome words. We make known Christ. We announce his death, burial, and resurrection. Glory to God. Are you blessed? Get on your feet. That's all I've got for you tonight. Amen. Zeko Lord of Osha. Brande Gebo Lord of God. Can we pray in tongues for another five, five you know, 30 seconds, one minute, everybody? Zezozo Zobiana Katolea. Membronda Golo de Boja Kata. Breda Soko, Babarika Tona Kalia. Jejo Koroto Subalena. Negro do Zocolo de Berekita Nangalina Mamba Boro do Sokelia. Pray, 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 pray. Ega Bandola. Ega Bandola. Lebro da Jekele de Baba. Glory to God. In the name of Jesus. Somebody shout a powerful amen. Listen to me everybody. I want to pray for a few people tonight. I want to lay hands on some people. Brother Paul says, I long to see you. That I may impart spiritual gift. To the end that you may be established. Impartation does not put something new in you. Impartation steers up what is inside. There are abilities you carry that are dormant. When an impartation happens, they come alive. And suddenly, you see yourself doing things you couldn't do before. Am I talking to somebody here? So that's what Paul meant by, I long to see you. Because when we meet, deep color to deep. Deep calls to deep. When hands are laid, something happens. You don't have to feel something. It's not a feeling. It's a knowing. 
you may feel you may not feel but when hands are laid something happens and in my conferences i lay hands on people ministers believers to stir up God's deposit lying dormant inside you. And I speak prophetic words as the Holy Ghost moves. I believe that in Eldorado there will be an explosion. After this conference, there will be an explosion. You know, the Lord preachers think we are few. They don't know that we are taking over. Give us a few years. The Lord preachers will be very unpopular. Because the knowledge of Christ is covering the earth. If you are preaching Christ and they are laughing at you, keep preaching it. I came to tell you where many. You may be in Eldoret and not know what is happening around the world. I am all over the world and friends are telling you there's a new army rising all over the world. They are rising in our universities. They are rising among our young people. They are rising among our children and they are preaching this gospel. They are understanding this gospel. I'm telling you, believe me. All over my country, they're rising everywhere in Nigeria. People with sound doctrine. And they're facing out the other gospel. And it's happening in Kenya. It's happening in your nation. If you're a pastor, invest in your young people. Teach them ministry. Teach them sound doctrine. Teach them. Don't ignore them. Young people catch it faster than old people who have been messed up. Old people have been messed up. They keep fighting because there's a lot of junk in their head. Young people are still fresh. When you bring it, they see it. And when they catch it, they run. Invest in your young people. Don't ignore them. They are the future. Any ministry that invests in young people is a ministry of the future. And any church that doesn't have young people is a, is a dying church. It's a dying church. We must invest in young people. We must pray for young people. And we must release young people. We must show them ministry. So that they begin ministry in schools. In colleges. In universities. They are already on fire. So when out of, they are out of school, they are already flames teaching good are you following let's pour into our young people let's pour the fire let's teach them to pray for three hours five hours ten hours they have the stamina they have the energy and they have the time i'm telling you the truth don't ignore them they don't have money but the future is theirs and a ministry that invests in young people is a ministry with a legacy. It's a tomorrow's ministry. Most of the young people that follow me globally are young people. That's why if you try nonsense against me on social media, they have time. They will sit on you. If you run, they will follow you to your inbox and tell you, why are you running? I'm waiting for you. Meet me here. Have you observed? They are young, young people. And they are very intelligent. When they give you grammar, you have to carry dictionary and follow them. They are always waiting. Abhi, always waiting. Just say nonsense. Thunder them. Some will teach you English language online. Say that English you just spoke. Have you checked it? One, one Nigerian father came on my page and wanted to insult me. Five young men followed him. First of all, they disgraced him on my page. Then they followed him to his inbox. And he asked one of them, do you people want to remove my trouser in public? <laughs> it's okay if you don't want us to remove your trouser in public, go and remove that statement. He went back and removed it. Why? Why? Young people. They give you scriptures. One of them will say, you know, I've been in ministry for 40 years. He said, leave that. We respect your age, but this thing you are saying is not correct. <laughs> you
you don't let your father speak nonsense in public you will tell him daddy that is not the way to say it say it like this he's your father but you're correcting him and he will take it because you're his son and these young people are everywhere we have them even in Kenya here plenty and they are very sound when they do exegesis for you you just be smiling with thanksgiving <laughs> this afternoon <laughs> this afternoon i was checking your page you know a lot of people are watching these services so i was checking your page and then somebody said dr damina a controversial preacher but i have been looking at the things he says i've not found any scripture to contradict him he's the apostle paul of our time <laughs> Amen. Young people, they're on the run, man. And I tell you, young people will change Kenya. Some of them are here, and some of them are in different places. They will change Kenya. They will face out the old. The old that refuse to change, they will face them out. You know, I was telling uh, Pastor Kennedy, I was telling Pastor Kennedy this afternoon, that you know the way God operates? The old people that the elderly people that came out of egypt to the promised land they were arguing with god god allowed all of them to die is their children that entered the promised land because their children believed you didn't hear what i said that is how god operates no they didn't the children didn't see miracles children are not looking for miracles they want evidence it is the old people that are looking for miracles because poverty has punished them too much so they are looking for a way of escape from poverty so they are looking for miracles the young generation are not intimidated by poverty because they know what to do in their time to make wealth so they want solid evidence am i talking to somebody here yeah? Look, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. I travel around. I've been around. Continent to continent. Young people are rising massively. Very educated. And they, they engage well. Somebody say, give one fact to an intelligent person. He will be persuaded. But give 40 facts to a fool. He will never be persuaded. Some people, even when you show them from scripture, look at it, look at it. They say, I know it's there, but what is but? You can't argue with my experience. Is your experience Bible? Did it die for anybody? Glory to God. Hallelujah. I love you guys. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, we will do many things in the year to come. Amen. You didn't say amen to that. Amen. How many of you believe there are things in you that should be stirred up? Are you ready for a stirring? Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray. You know the Bible says desire. Bible says covet, covet, desire, strong desire, covet earnestly. We're going to desire, we're going to covet earnestly, and then i'm just going to minister to everyone that, that wants me to minister to them you know once we start you just come and, and pass through it's not going to take time you know it's not going to take time you don't have to fall my hand doesn't have to stay on your head for five minutes it's contact and transmission once my hand touch you it goes through it doesn't have to be there don't hold my hand Today, today, I will not let you go until you bless me. You are already blessed. Glory! Glory! Then once we finish laying hands, we'll sit down for a few more minutes. Let me...
Pray tongues, pray tongues. Lift your two hands and pray tongues. Anger, 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 
city men are going to begin to rise who are seeking for this truth and there will be a connection between them and you you will disciple them they are coming in their numbers they are coming in their tens they are coming in their hundreds they are coming in their thousands and before you know in their tens of thousands all over this land the glory of my world will fill the city will fill the land therefore be strong Therefore be strong. Therefore be strong. And of a good courage. Be strong. And of a good courage. For yourself. Take heed to yourself. Don't allow opposition distract you. Don't allow opposition distract you. Take heed to yourself. Don't be distracted. Keep your eyes on the focus. Be consistent. Stay with it in and out of season preach it preach it you may not be popular it is not a popularity pursuit it is not a popularity pursuit but sure and quiet my work is being carried out my work is being carried out be strong and of a good courage for the people that are looking up to you be strong and of a good courage for this land that i give to you stand strong quit ye like men don't be scared rise in my strength and take over the land for i have given you the land says the spirit of god thank you lord jesus go ahead and give god praise go ahead and give god praise go ahead and give god praise. go ahead and give god praise Go ahead and give God praise. Go ahead, give God praise. Somebody shout, we are taking over the land with the gospel of Christ. Every pulpit on this land will preach this gospel in Jesus' name. I didn't hear a good amen. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Are you blessed tonight? Listen, friends, things will just be crumbling. You just see men coming in. A hunger in the land for the truth of Christ. One shall bring 50. Two shall bring 50. Five shall bring 1,000. Something is shifting in the land. Something is breaking in the land. I speak to you by the apostolic mandate on my life. Your land has opened up. Go in and pack the harvest. Go in and pack the harvest. Nothing shall be impossible. Out of this land, I see heavy churches rising, breaking forth. I see disciples raising thousands. I see them coming. I see them coming. The day of barrenness is over. The harvest is ripe. Go in. Put in the sickle. And bring in the harvest. Thank you, Father. Give him praise. 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 Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are you blessed? Praise God.
going to answer questions in a few minutes, but I want to take your offerings. We give to honor Christ. We give in faith. We give with joy. We give intentionally. In a meeting like this, you give your best. Like I said, you support the conference. Don't just give carelessly. You lose not when you give. Your reward awaits you before Jesus. Thank you, Father. I pray for everybody giving tonight. Our offerings are a sweet smell. And the blessing is upon your people. Thank you for the privilege to give to a work. And thank you that through our giving, the gospel continues to expand. In Jesus' name. Can I have a good amen? Listen to me. You can be seated. The baskets will go round. Those making transfers, the banking details are on the board, on the screen. I'm going to answer questions. And those of you who want to get the books, you can be getting the books. And those who want me to autograph, I will autograph them at the end of the questions. Amen. I didn't hear your amen. The account is on the screen. While the offerings are going on and all of that, I'll be answering the question. Give us audio, please. Amen. Just to clarify, pay bill, the account is offering good. Then please confirm it should be Jesus Vineyard Church. Praise God. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? Very. Very blessed. Wonderful. So we are going to be as answering, asking and answering some questions. I have a few here with me, and then we'll pick the rest from the audience. Okay. Wow. All right. I was married to a bishop, but now divorced, and I face opposition in ministry. Sorry. It's okay. I was married um, to a bishop, but now divorced, and I face opposition in ministry. What should I do? Divorce is not the end of life. You didn't come on earth to marry. <laughs> you only married along the line. And marriage ends on earth. There's no reward for marriage before Jesus. So don't let anybody stigmatize you. It's unfortunate your marriage didn't work. But that's not the end of life. So clean up, put yourself together, and refuse to be defined Amen. by what happened in your marriage. Be defined by Christ. Amen. Stand up and do the work of ministry. Do the work of ministry. However, people like you will need to be very close to your pastor, your spiritual father, because he will take time to strengthen you and walk you through until you are out of that whole stuff and you begin to do the ministry that is yours in Christ. Amen. There are more reasons to live than marriage. Amen. Amen. Did I say something? Yeah, you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. Before Christ, it's not noticed. It's only on net that people notice you. God doesn't know you are married. In Christ, there's no male. Marriage is on earth. And it ends here. No reward for it in heaven. Is it clear? I have a book, Understanding Relationships, Marriage, and Family Life. And it deals with all those dynamics and how to bounce back from them. So check if they don't have it there. You can get the soft copy on Amazon tonight. And you can begin to chew on it. It will help you a lot because I dealt with divorce, remarriage, and I dealt with all those dynamics. So. Thank you. Um, can I kindly get more ex exegesis on First John 5, 16? Especially the target group John is addressing. Note, is John referring to believers or non-believers? First John 5, 16. First John, chapter 5, verse 16. If any man sees his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin unto death, 
There is a sin unto death. I did not say that you shall pray for it. <laughs> Exegesis. I have 35 hours teaching on that verse. 35 hours. No exaggeration. If you order from my office, you will get all the exegesis. It's 35 hours. It's called Soteria 5. Soteria 5. It's on 1 John 5, 16. But let me give you a teaser. A sin that is not unto death is like you offend a brother or do something wrong against one another. Sin unto death is the rejection of Christ. But it has to be given to you with exegesis. It's Soteria 5. You can order for it and spend time so that you understand the whole concept of sin. The whole of it in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's a very powerful series. And it also deals with hellfire. Is there anything like hellfire? Is there anything like lake of fire? You know, all of those things about fire, fire. Who was it created for? Or why did God create it? Who will go there? Will people be born in hell forever? All those are in Soteria 5 with scriptures and exegesis. So I recommend that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Act 5. Who really killed Anania and Sapphira? Peter killed Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> it wasn't God. Peter ministered to them the law of sin and death. Peter even invented a verse that does not exist in the Bible. You have sinned against the Holy Ghost. That's the only place you see that. You don't see it anywhere else. Then he scared them. He scared him. And fear struck him. And he died. You know, people look up to preachers, especially people that are not informed. They see preachers as God. So when a preacher looks at a man and says, it will never be well with you. Look at my eyes. Believers can be weak in faith. How much less unbelievers? So Peter killed them. That is why after that, nobody was killed in church. Because even Peter discovered he didn't do well. So that is why when the man that wanted to buy power came, if it was Peter or before, he would have killed him. You understand? By chapter 8, Peter has grown from chapter 5. Remember, Bible chapters are not today and tomorrow. Sometimes between one chapter and another is 10 years. So by chapter 8, Peter has grown. He just told the man, your heart is not right. Go and make your ways right. But even in chapter 5, he will have told him, you are a dead meat for trying to buy power. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, two more and then we can pick from the audience. Okay. After receiving this revelation of finished work of Christ, can I continue serving under the man who is dancing with Moses in the name of honor? If you do that, you are a hypocrite. <laughs> if you do that, you are a hypocrite. It means you have now known the truth and you are choosing falsehood. You can't sit under Moses when Christ is your savior. That's idolatry. So get out of that church. Look for a Christ-centered church. Your loyalty is not to a man, it's to Christ. You're only loyal to the man because he's loyal to Christ. Case closed. Thank you. What is the purpose of an earthly life if you are a believer? The purpose of an earthly life is to win souls and to make disciples. That's all. Why do you have a job so you can have food to eat while doing the work? Your primary assignment is not law. Your primary assignment is evangelism and discipleship. Law is just by the side. That's why we even tell students and the people who work in our church, if they transfer you from this city to another city for work, you're going there for church planting. You're going there to raise disciples. That is the reason for moving from nation to nation in the Bible. To go and raise disciples. So the purpose is to win souls and raise disciples. 
Thank you. I've finished the questions that I have here. So we are going to pick questions from the audience. Do you have questions? Hands up. Tony will be bringing the microphone to you. Praise God. Um, Kamau, Pastor, ICCM, Grace Family, here in town. I want to ask on uh, John chapter 15, verse 5 and 6, about losing salvation. Because, uh, okay. yeah. yeah. Let's start from verse 1. Don't read 5 till you read 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. When you talk about husband man, you're talking about a farm. The husband man is the owner of the farm. The farm does not take care of itself. A farm is taken care of by the farmer. My father is the farmer, the husband man. And it's a parable. It's a parable. Next verse. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. In the original, taketh away means he raises up. He lifts it up. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bear forth more fruit. So, if you are in me and you are not bearing fruit, it is the job of Jesus to lift you up. And if you are bearing fruit, he, Jesus, will purge you to bear more. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, he lifts up. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Next verse. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. Next verse. Five now. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abided in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So what he's simply saying is, I am the life in you that produces results for the kingdom. That's all. You don't lose salvation. Many people, where they think it's loss of salvation is where he say he take it away. But take it away is not English language. It's Bible language. Which means he lifts up so that it can be a fruit. Because it's the job of the farmer to make sure his farm is doing well. Wow, wow. Um, Tony, yes, thank you. Next question. I think you have my question with you, but you didn't brought it or bring it up. Okay, sure. Please ask. Okay. Uh, in relationship to, you've talked about, uh, you said that uh, uh, Holy Communion, as a new believer, according to the epistle, we are not required to practice it no, anymore. But I'm wondering, because uh, you picked s some words from Paul, and uh, if you begin reading it from, I don't know, it, I gave you a First Corinthians word, something, that what I received from the Lord, is what I'm delivering to you. Did Paul meet Jesus all his life? Did Paul and Jesus ever meet? Not once. So what does he mean by what I received from the Lord? Since him and the Lord never met. So that means what he read from Luke. So he was making reference to what Luke taught. Using it to teach the church how to walk in love. He was not endorsing eating. He was using eating and drinking as a parable to teach the love of the brethren. If you read chapter 10, which is the pretext of chapter 11, he said, we are the bread. We are the bread. Put it up for me, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Go to verse 16 for time. The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion, not holy communion? The fellowship of the body of, of the blood of Christ. So our fellowship is the blood of Christ that makes us fellowship. The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Next verse. For we be many are one bread. All of us are the bread. He's not talking about something to eat. Is it clear? We are the bread. So by the time you finish this foundation, you now go to chapter 12. You understand that all that Paul was saying is that we ought to walk in love with one another. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Is it clear? It's not saying we should be eating elements. 
saying all of us are the bread and we ought to care for one another that's why in chapter 12 he said you come together for a love feast some are filled some are not filled he said it ought not to be so because if you have and your brother doesn't have you should share with him so what is dealing with in Corinth is the love work not eating of something however brother brother over there there's a book there the communion table and it deals with the whole concept from Genesis to Revelation on the communion. It will help you a lot. It's exegesis. It's about 400 pages. God bless you. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Next question. Praise the Lord. I have a question. This pertain on first fruit. First fruit. Yes, because okay. I've seen there are ministers of the grace. Who are going to collect in January. Who are collecting first fruit. They're so, already planning to collect it in January. <laughs> Your first salary of the year. Yes. So it says scam. First fruit. Christ is our first fruit. It's Christ. And believers that get born again in a church are the first fruit of that church. He's not talking about money. He's talking about people. Is it clear? Amazing. Amazing. Next question. Okay. Praise the Lord. I'm Dennis from Moy University. I have a question. I know we cannot lose salvation, but I wanted a clarity on Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 to 8. Very good. Thank you for giving me all the verses. First of all, when you read the book of Hebrews, there are three things you want to ask yourself. I mean, first thing, what, who was the book written to? It was written to Jews. Believing Jews, non-believing Jews, would be believing Jews. That says the premise for the book of Hebrews. Then, the writer begins to retire things. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, he retires the prophets. The prophet spoke to the fathers. Had in these last days, no more prophets spoken in the Son. So he retires the prophets. Chapter 2, he retires the angels. That God has said all angels should worship Christ. Chapter 3, verse 1. Go to chapter 3, verse 1. He talks about partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider Jesus. All right. Then he begins to talk about Aaron and talks about Christ. Then the next verse. I mean the next, yes. Aaron and Christ. Moses and Christ. The next verse. verse chapter 4, sorry. Chapter 4 of Hebrews. Chapter 4. He now talks about entering rest, the rest which is Christ. The rest is not a Saturday. The rest is Christ. So he retires Saturday worship. Are we together? In chapter 5. So that's what he was doing. He was doing a contrast to convince the Jews that Jesus is more important than their elements of worship. So he now comes to chapter 6 where we are talking about. He begins to talk about chapter 6 of Hebrews verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once in light and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Next verse. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Next verse. If they shall fall away. Watch, 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 watch. Put on your thinking caps now. To renew them again to repentance. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Question. Can anybody crucify Jesus afresh? Can anybody put Jesus to an open shame? So the same way Jesus cannot be crucified afresh, when you've tasted those things, you cannot fall. So this place is actually the guarantee for eternal salvation. Because the writer of Hebrews told you that only once Jesus died, so there's no afresh. So since there'll be no afresh, there'll be no falling. And then to further brought tracks, it get to verse 8. Verse 8 of the same scripture. But that which beareth thorns and breasts is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be born. Talking about, you know, the previous verse. But look at verse, verse 9. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we do speak. So there are better things for us. Not losing salvation. We have things that accompany salvation. Is it clear? So it's a guarantee for salvation. Next. Okay, we are going to take two final 
three final questions, Mr. Timbiti, and there is a lady and a gentleman at the back, Amen. and then we will put a comma, okay? Amen. Thank you very much, Doctor. Yes. Thank you very much for expounding these things to us. I have two questions. One, when you mentioned about marriage, there is this scripture in First Peter, should be 3, 7, says, live with them according to understand so that your prayers may not be hindered. What is it referring to? Prayers hindered is simple. Yeah. If I was married to her, yes. and we have a misunderstanding, yes. and we are in malice, yes. me and her cannot, be, cannot pray. Yeah. Because malice will not allow her to pray for me. Uh -huh. And will not even allow me to want her to pray for me. Yes. So the malice have hindered our prayer. Yes. Thank you. It doesn't mean that if you quarrel with your wife, God will not answer your prayer. Okay. No. It means two of you, that misunderstanding, if it's not resolved, yes. will not allow two of you to pray. So it becomes a hindrance to your prayer. So that's why you deal with them yes. according to knowledge Amen. so that there will be no division yes. in your relationship. Thank you. Is it clear? Well answered. Yes. And the, the, the question I had is uh, Hebrews chapter 10 yes. and in verse number 26 which talks about when we willfully go on sinning. Willfully. I, I yes. dealt with that yesterday. Put yeah. it up. Hebrews 10, 26. Look at it. Hebrews 10, 26. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. A believer is not an adversary. So that scripture is not for believers. It's for people that reject the gospel. Tested means the gospel was preached to them. But they rejected it. So it's not for believers. It's for non-believers. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord, brethren. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, brethren. I was sent to you by a friend of mine to ask on his behalf. He runs a bar here in town. He's a believer. He wants to know if he can continue with our business or he close it. If he can continue with his business. Oh, be a business. First of all, beer is not a sin. I don't have never drank beer. So don't look at me like that. I've never drank beer. I don't drink beer. But beer is not a sin. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Jesus turned water to wine. That wine was alcohol. I'm telling you the truth. It's not a sin. Every one of you take alcohol every day. In your food, in your cake, there is alcohol. Even in your steak, even in your carbohydrates, medicines. There's alcohol. So alcohol is not a sin. Even in tea, there's alcohol. However, it must be done in moderation. Moderation. Okay? Now, hold on, hold on. That laughter was very clear. <laughs> Red wine, white wine. <laughs> now, having said that it is not a sin, as a believer, you don't want to indulge in something that has the ability to make you a slave. The problem with alcohol is the addiction. When you start enjoying it, you become a slave of it. And it robs you of sanity. So that's why I say he that drinks alcohol is not wise. Because it will soon make you a slave. So since the addiction is very cunning, leave it alone. That's all. Leave it alone. That is why Paul will take Timothy. Take a little alcohol for your stomach. So which means alcohol has medicinal value. However, under prescription. Yeah. <laughs> Are we clear? But it's not a sin. If by mistake, I'm coming there, if by mistake you drink alcohol, don't be condemned. If you're a drinker, you discover it's alcohol, finish it. <laughs> Give thanks and say no more. <laughs> 
don't be condemned. Don't be. Don't be. Just tell yourself, next time I will check well. You know, uh, Pastor Karanja, one time they took me to a member's house who was dedicating a child in our church. And those days, when I go to member's houses, there's a brother that used to go with me. And then he used to help serve me something to drink. So we got to this house with mama after a Sunday service. And then we sat down. They brought us things to drink. So the brother stood up without checking, opened the bottle, poured it for me. I was thirsty after service. And it was cold. I just took it and I drank. Then my eyes started doing like this. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me like this? <laughs> my eye was doing like this. I started feeling somehow. For the first time in my life. And I didn't know it was alcohol. So I said to mama, I said, it, it looks like I'm under an attack. I think we should go home now. Because I really need to get home. So she said, okay, let's go. So we stood up and told them, thank you. And we left, got in the car. Managed to get home. I was still feeling totally out of sorts. I didn't know what was wrong. So I got in the house, changed from my suits quickly, put on my house clothes. And then I said, let me just pray. So that whatever it is, it can be neutralized. So as I bent down to pray, the ground was very far. <laughs> so now I wanted to reach the ground and I hit my head. Boy. <laughs> I laid there and I slept. When I woke up, I was normal. So I asked them to go and check the bottles that were served. And they discovered it was Bacchus, 18%. That was heavy. So we don't drink. What about the business of selling? Whatever is not good for you, don't give it to your brother. Whatever is not good for you, don't give it to your brother. Is that clear? Thank you. Final question. Okay, praise God. Okay, I have. I had a discussion with my colleague that who was contradicting what I know that God does not kill. Even Pastor, the man of God talked about it yesterday. But they were telling me that they know God can kill. And they gave me so many examples, even others I can't remember. But this gentleman was telling me that even God killed Herode, God killed some other people. There are those who are the leaders Maybe, but according to me, I could say that maybe it was like a, a, a punishment or, or somehow. But in another way, I know that God gave us a, a free will to choose the good and the bad. So I will think that like if we can choose, if we choose bad, God allows you to go on with what you are doing. And if you choose the good one, he also allows you to, to do that. So I understand that God also can allow the devil to use you if you choose to be used by the devil. I don't know. You can help me understand well and know what to go back and tell them about it. That question is a good question, but it requires a lot of teaching. It's not just God kills. God doesn't kill. No, God doesn't kill. How can you say God kills? It's beyond that. Because they will cite for you Bible examples. And each of them you must explain. So it, it requires a lot of learning. I will recommend for you. Um, I have a teaching series. Audio you can order for it. Um, it's part one, two, three, four, five. And each of them is about 30 hours. One, two, three, four, five. So that's 30 times five. That's how many hours? 150 hours of teaching for you to be able to defend that God doesn't kill. It will help you if you can patiently go through it. I will advise you to order for it so that you are grounded. So that when you are speaking, you speak with authority. And you even quote the scriptures before they quote it and explain it. So you disarm them. Do you understand? And I will encourage you not to discuss it with them for now. Give it three to four months. Then when you have listened enough and made notes, tell them, hey, 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 that discourse we had the other day, when can we talk? And when they arrive, you give them the scriptures. 
and explain. Then ask them any argument. It will be fine. See, in doctrinal matters, don't rush to argue. Take time to know what you are going to discuss so they don't paralyze your faith. Because the critics are very detrimental. You must be grounded. Now that series is called um, uh, The Misunderstood God. The Misunderstood God, part one, part two, part three, part four, part five. It deals with evil, killings, deaths, and all the scripture that says, I kill it, I make it alive. All the scriptures that say, and the anger of the Lord killed them. All those Old Testament scriptures are clearly explained in that series. They misunderstood God. But you are right. God doesn't kill. And the simple answer is, Jesus is God who became a man. Jesus never killed anybody. Which means God never killed. Because Jesus said, what I see my father do, I do. And Jesus is the same yesterday. If he never killed today, it means he never killed before. It means he will never kill again. So who is the killer? John 10.10. 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That should be a teaser, but that series will help you. Thank you so much. Allow me, please, to pick this question so that we can represent this section. Have you allowed me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Damina. Um, marriage and ministry. 29 years ago, this pastor gets married and uh, waits in church, and they do ministry for all those 29 years. Now, about three years ago, he gets tired of the lady, files for divorce, case is still in court, and uh, big ministry, about 10,000 people, seven radio stations, about two TV stations on satellite, and sees one of the staff in the church, admires her, and recently they did traditional marriage. Um, what would be your advice to even by the Holy Spirit to the pastor, the membership, the woman who has been taken out of marriage, and uh, the woman that is now traditionally married with a pending case in court. Thank you, sir. Is the man listening to this teaching? I doubt. So how can I advise? <laughs> to him, he may not, but to the body of Christ, because there are many that listen, and uh, like I said, seven radio stations, so not a good airwaves. He's not a good example. Thank you, sir. People shouldn't follow him. Thank you, sir. A man of God must be a good example. First of all, he must be the husband of one wife. Meaning he has to keep his marriage as an example. So that couples in his church will also keep their marriage. A man of God must have long suffering. Things may not all be altogether good in the marriage. He must be able to endure as a consecration for his ministry. Okay? It's not a good example. Thank you, sir. And uh, if he is left to go away with it, his members will start sending their wives away and picking another one, and he has no power to talk to them. So it makes him a bad example. It affects his integrity and testimony, and sound thinking people won't stay there. However, pastors can have marriages that never worked out, and pastors could divorce, and the issue has to be very clear with sound counsel. And if a pastor divorces, if a pastor divorces, he should try and stay without marriage. He should try. And if eventually he decides to, be, to remarry, he should let it take time and let things be clear. With counsel, he may get married in the future. But not just get out, get in. It means you're a lascivious person. You don't have character. Because if you are really genuinely married, it will be difficult for you to walk out and walk in. Sometimes five years after divorce, you are still trying to get over it. So to just come out and get in another one, you are not a serious person. Because marriage is your life. You can't rip your life apart and attach another life. It means you are a player in the marriage. Because if you are really serious in that marriage, you are even still going through the pain that you are not able to keep your wife, whom you are the savior of. That is still, you are still recovering. Don't just jump into another, because the way you jump in, you will jump out. What made you drove the first one will make you drive the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. 
And when you start enjoying divorce, you will keep divorcing till you die. Because it now becomes a hobby. Divorce becomes like your toy. You pick, you throw out, you pick, you throw out. I have a friend who is about 40 something. He has divorced four wives since with the fifth. And I know the fifth will go very soon. Because he's enjoying it. There's no marriage that is perfect. We all tolerate and endure. There's none. Even the new wife you want to marry is not perfect. She may be worse than the first one. And the, the, the wife that agreed to marry a divorced man, she herself have problem. Because the same thing he did to the first wife, he would do to you. <laughs> I have a teaching on wisdom for living. Wisdom for living. It's a series. It deals with wisdom. It deals with marriage and ministry and life. If you order for it, it will help you. It's called wisdom for living. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Can we give Dr. Abel a round of applause, please? Sorry. A good, good round of applause. Oh, thank you. Give her an applause, too, for asking the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank God you. richly bless you. Let me welcome Pastor Karanja to take over. Yes, Pastor Karanja, we're all handing over to you. I will hang around to sign the books. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Wow. Let's put our hand together for... Please don't move out. It's good for us to wait for the final. Please, there are some people who bought the books in the afternoon, and maybe some of them have gone with those books. And yet, Hezron is there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Bona Hesro, Sifiwe. Ni wagapi wamebarikiwa na huduma ya... Ni wagapi? Najua kwa wakati huu hasiki kiswahiri. Kwa hivyo tunayesta musee genya. <laughs> Ni wakapi wamebarikiwa. One way to be a blessing also to him. Bitabu zake ziko pale nyuma. Get, eh, chukua kope ya kitabu. Dio ukue wa baraka katika mwiri wa nani. Wa kristo. Kitu chapiri. Please before you move out. Please just give me eh, one minute. Just before you move out. Amen. Please. Kuna kitu tunahitaji. Na kuna kamiti about tulikuwa tumeadamu kutano huu. Tulikuwa na kiboy, Jane, eh, 